My name is Larry Tzin. I'm working at the Ben Gurion University, and our campus is actually located one hour south of Ben Gurion, and we all study uh, desert research and question regarding to uh, the agriculture uh, problems. But my study is mainly focused on plant and insect interaction. And uh, today I will present uh, our research on characterizing the function of plant succinates, and I'll explain a minute what this is, uh, against herbivore damage, mainly focused on maize and wheat and other crops. We mentioned a lot the uh, yield loss to different uh, aspects, but um, also insects or herbivores cause a massive damage to plants. They, approximately 50% of the yields are like herbivores, and when they eat our crops, we call them pests. Um, they can consume, as you can see here, they consume the grain, the fruits. They can also consume uh, the shoots and the root uh, tissue, as well as consuming nutrients, as you can see with this egg, which is one of the major subjects of our research. So this is what we call the direct damage, whether by chewing and consuming. There's also, um, sorry, there's also a, an indirect damage, and many insects, like aphids, like these small insects, are transmitting viruses, plant viruses. And as you can see here, these plant viruses reduce the photosynthetic rate and overall yield loss. Also in this photo, you can see some fungi, and this fungi are actually feeding on the honeydew that aphids uh, spread on it. So overall, approximately, I'm sure you know, 20% uh, of the global crop production lost every year during herbivory. And this number can vary depending on the year on the crops, but overall it's a, a high percentage of yield loss to um, one biotic stress. So we need to take it in account that um, plant resistance is one of the goals of uh, improving yield. Um, so how plants and insects interact? Um, insects in general, they, whether they are feeding, uh, not feeding like aphids or uh, like aphids or caterpillars, tree insects, they um, interact with the plants by spitting or uh, releasing the saliva. They consume uh, essential compounds. They simply honeydew. They consume viruses, and they in overall they try to reduce the immune, immune response of the plants. In response, plants recognize that they're being attacked. They increase their defense uh, of signaling molecules, so it's just mainly just monic acids and acidic acids. These are the main key there. Also, they change their metabolic uh, profile, whether it's a central metabolite or a specialized metabolite. Um, and the, the, the interaction is not only in the, what we call the local area, which is where the insects are infested, but there's also a systemic change. So also nearby leaves or wood system can respond to this uh, interaction and change their metabolism, allocate uh, their metabolites in response uh, to this interaction. One interesting group of metabolites, which I'm not going to talk to, that it's a volatile molecules. Uh, some volatiles are emitted by the plant. This is a long distance molecule that the plants allocate to interact with the environment. They can transmit to the environment either to interact with another plant to prime their defenses or uh, to signal to predators and parasitoids to find their prey. So this is excellent. Uh, system for a triploid uh, a metropic, uh, system, but again, most of our research is focused on the diplopic, uh, the insect and the plant. The group of metabolites that we study are small molecules, we call them benzoxazinoids, um, but just in general, small molecules are uh, toxic molecules that consume directly by the plant and uh, the insect. There's other defense mechanisms like uh, mechanical defenses, whether they are thorns or uh, but we have studied uh, small toxic molecules. So what are benzoxazinoids? These are the major protective compounds in maize, wheat, uh, white barley, and rye. Uh, it's much mostly abundant in nut tissue, although you can also find them in, uh, in some uh, grain product, like in grain or some baking product of rye. The major compound called uh, Dimboa, you can see this name, but again, the overall pathway the genes named BX1 to BX12. There's also recent publication of BX13 and 14 in maize. And in response to uh, environment stresses, whether um, it's an uh, um, insect pathogen or even a aeropathic response, this molecule being degraded and mobilized to the infested area. They mobilize in an um, they lose their sugar. To, uh, the reason there is an additional sugar is to prevent autotoxicity. But these um, molecules with average sugar are highly toxic also to the plants. They're mobilized to the infested area, they degrade it, and then they toxify their, uh, their uh, biotic stress. Again, either insect pathogen or aeropathic response. So overall, it's a broad spectrum um, 
secondary highlights. So the first question is to identify the function of this molecule in made. And what we did, uh, we did a transcriptomic and metabolomic analysis using a maze, a Z maze, a session AB73. And we tested the response after infestation with Cidoco Exequa, which is the, one of the major tests in the North US. And, and what we did, we looked at the, sorry, again, we looked at the expression data of the gene expression and metabolite. So in these graphs, you can see the gene name, BX1 to BX11. And, these are the pole change according to 24 hours of feeding. So what you can see from this graph is that the genes are highly induced by caterpillars feeding. Even from the first hour after uh, caterpillars uh, infestation, the genes are highly induced. So there's a massive uh, gene changes, including these two metabolites, the DIMBO adiposite and the HDBO adiposite. This is a methylated form of this compound. And these are the two major and um, predominant metabolites of the pathway. So what we did next is to identify the function of two of these genes, and we identified two um, responsible insertion knockouts of BX1 and BX2. So this was done on the different BX1, the W22 maze BX1, and we checked how these um, mutants change the insect uh, behavior. So when you're working with caterpillars, um, the best bioassay is just to measure the bad way. So if the fence is less toxic or not produce as much as defense metabolites, sorry, and not produce the defense metabolites due to knockout of BX1 and BX2, the caterpillars will grow better because their defense are less susceptible and less resistant. So what we found out that when we knock down this gene or use the transposal insertion, both BX1 knockout or BX2 knockout, um, the caterpillars were big. That means the defense are more susceptible, um, which indicates the function of the pathway. We also did similar essay by looking on athletes, and this time we picked the Arubmedis, the Conliff athletes, so these are fluid figures, and this is how they look like, it's a uh, two millimeter uh, insect. And what you can see here is the same pathway, um, gene response and metabolites uh, level, and what we found out that the genes respond quite uh, transitly. So after uh, four to eight hours of infestation, there's a, some induction of this pathway, then it's reduced to the basal level, so there's like an early response, but not continuous response of this insect. We also decided to look at the uh, insect bioassay, but working with the ethics um, required to use a different uh, approach. So what, uh, what is the approach for studying uh, ethics susceptibility is by counting the number of ethics, the ethics progeny of the candidate. So what we find out when we look at this, uh, What we find out when we look on these uh, three mutants, the BX1, BX6, and also got the addition of BX1, BX2, and BX6, we found out that these plants are more susceptible, much more susceptible to the BX1 and BX2, and the BX6 is significantly um, susceptible, but not as much as the others. And the reason that also the DIMBOA has some toxicity uh, function in plants. So this is a compound that is highly abundant in rye, but not in maize. So this pathway, uh, is, as I mentioned, is a protective pathway in maize and some other crops like wheat, uh, oat, and rye. It's also abundant in some liquids. But the question is, uh, how, what is the function of the pathway in other crops that are less studied, like wheat, and oat, and rye? So we decided to uh, move to a new project. This is our new project in the lab, and study this pathway in wheat. But why wheat? So wheat is a staple crop. Uh, about 20% of the calories of protein consumed by humans is originated from wheat and is domesticated from the Near East. So, here you can see the cultivation of uh, the diploid, the tetraploid, and, uh, and the exoploid that originate from the East Near East. That means there is a lot of the genetic tools we can explore that are available in Israel, collaborate with geneticists that uh, collect these um, genes and this accession for years and expand our knowledge on, on wheat and this pathway in other accession besides it. One. So what we know so far about the dense of is in wheat is not uh, much. Um, here we mark in question mark all the, power, uh, the genes that are still uh, not uh, identified in May. So we know the BX1 to BX5 and then the, the 8 and 9, the GTs, but these genes, the dexidinase and the two transferons are still unknown. Also, the regulation of the pathway, whether there are constriction factors and transporters, and the function of this uh, pathway. Um, this model is actually adapted for maize, but we don't know as much uh, in wheat. 
and also uh, the effect of domestication on the pattern. So we decided to explore it uh, by looking or identifying the genes, study their function, and also explore the natural diversity of wheat and see how uh, the natural diversity uh, interacts with this pattern, or vice versa. So one approach to study and uh, to identify new genes the plant pathway is to look on gene expression and gene lo lo localization. So this is the model of the same pathway, the benzoxazinase, as it described in maize. And what you can see in here, you can see that some of the genes that already identify the BX1, the BX5, and the two GPs all co-localize in chromosome 4. So this, they located they located in the upper part of the pathway, but they're also um, located in the same uh, area on chromosome 4. Um, in this study, Jennifer uh, will discuss, uh, she looked at the gene expression using a massive gene expression from different uh, uh, RNA seed data, and what she found out that these genes are also co-expressed. And when she compared the co-expression to co-localization, she suggests that co-expression is even a stronger indication for genes that origin from the same pathway. So we're using the same approach of looking at co-expression to find out genes that are uh, unknown in wheat. So we, we did some... Um, Gene alignment compared to the DXUs, this uh, deoxygenase in, uh, in maize, and we found that one good candidate in wheat. And we look at the gene expression of BX3, which is already identified, and compare it to the BX6 uh, big gene. So we did a simple experiment. We took, uh, in this case, this is a dual wheat, it's a tetraploid with a sterile that uh, the pasta wheat has been cultivated, and we infested for 96 hours with alkali. This is the virtually old epic. This is a major. Uh, test in, in Israel for uh, wheat and some other area, areas in the world. So when we look at the gene expression using uh, retinal PCR, we found that, sorry again, that uh, the BX3, this is a known gene, is highly induced by uh, F8 induction, and also our putative new gene, the BX3. So now we're using this approach to look for uh, other gene like the methyl transfer as the BX7, and we extend that downstream, and also compare it with the and RNA seed data. Uh, besides using this approach, we're um, using the VIX system. So this is a virus induced gene silencing. This is adopted from the Valley Street Mosaic virus. This system developed uh, by Costa and Yuka from Ottenstead in the UK. And what we are doing right now is to um, knock down the first gene, the PX1, and look on the metabolites and the effects reproduction. So when uh, Raucho bit the postdoc from the lab, she is now studying this, using this system to identify new gene pathway. And what you can see in here, when she knocked down the BX1, she found out there's less metabolites because the pathway is silenced. But also when she measured the FH progeny after uh, four, four days of infestation, the same uh, virus I showed you before, the PK, she found out these plants are more susceptible. So this big gene, gene already been identified, but now we're using the same approach to study the BX6 and BX7. And unfortunately, we don't have the results yet, but this is a work in progress. So hopefully using transit expression of the VIG system, we will be able to identify quite fast the missing steps of the pathway. And what we are doing next is to compare the, um, the same with the background, this is the dual weight, and to check how different serial efforts change the pathway. Um, so what you can see, we tested three different uh, serial efforts, they all test for a, for a for crop like wheat and barley and even uh, maize. And we measured the efficacy after four days of infestation. This is a whole cage bioassay, so we put ethics for four days and we count the babies. And what you can find, you can see that the plants, um, the ethics respond in a different manner. So the s aminum, the A, so the s aminum is uh, relatively susceptible, there are plenty of ethics, while the s is resistant, and the alpha, the same ethics I showed you before, is relatively mild, so it's an uh, in between pattern. Um, pattern. We also look on the change of the pathway. So you, uh, we tested the same plants, the, the dual weight with different ethics, and what we found out that the plant responds in a different manner. So the DIMBOA, these metabolites were uh, induced by two different ethics, the uh, S-Venum and our body, uh, which is quite intuitive to say that the plants, um, when the plant is more um, resistant, there's high induction of these two metabolites. However, it's not clear what's going on with the edge DIMBOA, this methylated form, because we found out that highly induced by both most susceptible and also most resistant. Uh, so now we try to figure out what, what is the different toxicity of this uh, compound to the different ethics. We're also exploring, as I mentioned before, the natural variation of wheat. So we picked four different natural, uh, four different uh, genotype of wheat and we test them for the same ethics. In this case, again, it's the alpha, the uh, virtual 
So what we did, we picked different um, different uh, weight. One is the Svevo weight, I showed you before, the accession in Durum, so this is the tetrabloid. Compare it to the Zolitan, so the is the wild ever weight, it's been sequenced last year. And two bread weight, but the difference that one them is the bread weight that uh, we use in Israel, it's one of the local uh, genotypes, and the Chinese spring that is non local. So two bread weight, two tetrabloid, and one wild. So we measure the um, FX uh, reproduction in the greenhouse, and Dania, the postdoc in the lab, she looked at the number of FX using these uh, clip cages, and she found out that the wild and the uh, wild uh, was the most uh, susceptible. There are many more FX. So she also looked at the benzoxazinoids level, and what she found out was also quite intuitive that this um, expression is actually lacking of this metabolites. They're very expression of this accumulation of this metabolite. So this again supporting the, uh, the previous uh, study in May is that these compounds are essential for uh, FX defenses, also uh, in wood. We also de decided to take it one step forward and move to the field. So we uh, opened up a wheat field in our campus and we, as you can see, these are the same extension and we did this kind of essay with planting them uh, side by side and Zania, the PhD, she found the number of ethics, so this was the setup, it had three different blocks. And what you find out is actually the opposite results to what we found out in growth conditions. So what you can see there's a bitan, the one that was most uh, susceptible in the growth uh, group was actually the most uh, resistant in the field. Here she found out more than the, the alpha, she found three different ethics, and the rotten, the uh, local accession was the most uh, susceptible. So what she did, she also looked on the uh, phen phenology, the development of these plants. What you can see here, this is a development scale from a, a putting, heading, flowering of the wheat. So as brown it gets, this means the plants are more developed. And when she count the number of plants that you know, she run them according to the development, what she distinguished that what and the one that was the most susceptible is actually the one that they developed faster. So you can see it also with the swivel. This was the more uh, susceptible and actually more developed faster. So what we found out that again there's a strong um, link between development and resistance, maybe a trade-off between uh, growth and uh, resistance uh, that occur at a certain age of development. So we, now we decided to open the experiment and measure the differences along different developing stages and see when they're losing their benzos of the main expression and moving to a uh, other mechanism. We're also looking on uh, other metabolites besides benzoxazinoids. So we found out that in the older plants there, is no, there are no benzoxazinoids, but there are other metabolites. And this is untargeted approach of using LCMS, so just uh, using uh, looking on mass signals. So we don't know what these metabolites so far, but what we can tell that even when we take plants from the field in much older stages, they are uh, they have different metabolic pattern. You can see in this this is a negative ion and a positive ion. But what you can see in the negative that the plants that were uh, more resistant and uh, susceptible were actually clustered together. And uh, the Chinese spring and the Litan were separated. So now we can go deeper and find out what are these metabolites that involved in these differences according to uh, the developing stage. So this was done in much older plants. So let me just summarize uh, what I showed you. So we, again, the weight part is already um, we published and uh, we, we show the function of this gene using uh, different uh, heavy words, but the new part of it, which is just uh, it's a work in progress, is to identify these gene, genes in weight and we're using for expression uh, to find out the unknown genes in the pathway. We also identify the DIMBOA, but not other compounds are play a role in defenses, and it's unclear what is the function of the other metabolites like H DIMBOA and more degraded compounds. Um, these metabolites are not accumulated in mature plants. Um, we also uh, indicate that serial ethics uh, induce differently this pathway. So we can say serial ethics, but we need to remember that every uh, ethic species has uh, a different uh, pattern of expression, induction, and recognition by the plants. And also, that natural diversity in weight is a great tool to expose uh, the beds of the different sense and uh, identify uh, this mechanism. With this, I would like to turn to the the students who do the work. Zania, she's a PhD student and I would take postdoc. This is how Israel looked like in the springtime. So our campus is really in the desert. This is like half an hour southern. It's uh, Ramon Crater, it's a very special place. 
Uh, we also collaborate uh, with the Costa Canuca on the, the fix of using the human identity. And we have two collaborators from Tel Aviv that we're working on exploiting the natural diversity in the way. And we got a new project with my ideas from Peru and we have to study the pathway in the way. So thank you and what do you think?